I'm going to talk to you about uh, the epidemic of opioid dependence and overdose, a flood of opioids, and a rising tide of death. We're going to start with a quote from Herbert Spencer. There is a principle which is a bar against all information, which is proof against all arguments, and which cannot fail to keep a man in everlasting ignorance. That principle is contempt prior to investigation. Contempt prior to investigation is exactly what I suffered from when I got into the field of addiction medicine because I thought that the key to addiction was sobriety, first, last, and always, and that uh, methadone and buprenorphine were not consistent with sobriety, and how could you have a spiritual experience if you were doing those medications, all right? I have subsequently been proven wrong, not only by my own clinical experience, but by the scientific literature. Overdose is the number one cause of accidental death in the United States of America. The number one cause of death for patients less than 50 is overdose. Um, from 1963 to 1975, we lost 58,000 soldiers in Vietnam. In 2016, there were 64,070 deaths due to overdose. We have a Vietnam occurring in this country annually. What was the annual mortality rate for a frontline combat soldier in Vietnam? 3%. What is the annual mortality rate for shooting dope? It is 7.2%. You are two, two and a half times more likely to die from shooting dope than you are from going to war. What are we spending for war? Well, in 2017, the Department of Defense had a $700 billion budget. I saw John McCain on Face the Nation, and he was upset about 46 soldiers that died on maneuvers. And while the loss of any one person is a tragedy, maybe 64,000 is just a statistic. Um, but what are we, so what have we, pay 700 billion and for SAMHSA's budget for that's the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration what's their budget for uh, dealing with the opioid crisis it's 0.92 billion dollars over two years that is not a proportionate response in 2017 the Federal Aviation Administration's budget was $15.9 billion. This is a crashed 747. In 2015, we lost 52,404 people to drug overdose. That's 52 weeks in a year. That's 1,000 people per week. That's two 747s crashing every week in this country. How big do you think the budget for the FAA would be if you were having two 747s crashing every week? What would the public outcry be if you had two 747s crashing every week? There would be a hue and cry like you would not believe. But you know the FAA does a good job, and the Defense Department overall does a good job. There were zero uh, fatalities due to commercial air travel in 2017. We lose 176 uh, people to drug overdose every 24 hours. That's one every eight minutes. We lose one woman to breast cancer every 13 minutes. This disease is bigger than breast cancer. The treatments for this disease are far more effective than those for breast cancer, but they are not employed. We'll talk about that in a little bit. The opioid crisis, um, just some statistics. And I know that I'm bludgeoning you with statistics at this point, but 
It's to try to make the point that this problem is huge and there has not been a proportionate response. There have been 183,000 deaths from prescription opioids from 1999 to 2015. From 1999 to 2016, the total death rate rose to 247,070, with 26% of the total number of deaths having occurred in 2016 alone. This epidemic is accelerating. It has not hit its peak yet. There are two and a half million Americans addicted to opiates. Uh, those are prescription opioids. With two million addict, I'm sorry, there are two and a half million Americans addicted to opioids, two million addicted to prescription opioids, and a half million addicted to heroin. As the federal government cracks down on prescription opioids, the addict population is going to shift increasingly to heroin. And this slide shows exactly that. So in 2010, the blue line, 8% uh, heroin. In 2014, 23%. And 2015, 25%. So the number of people moving to uh, uh, heroin and uh, other opioids that are synthesized for the street is actually increasing. What's the uh, median age? the peak median age for death in this population, patients age 45 to 54, middle-aged people. Um, second uh, are the following age groups, and I won't read that for you. This is primarily an epidemic of white people. Uh, the second would be black, and final would be Hispanic. Males, as usual in the field of addiction medicine, outnumber females, both in terms of their rate of addiction and their rate of death. What we have on our hands is not only an epidemic of opioid dependence and overdose, we have an epidemic of failure. There is no proportionate response to this dilemma. Why is that? We fail because of stigma, reputation, disgust, ignorance, and denial. So what is stigma? For me, stigma is contempt prior to investigation. When I was a practicing internist, if a patient came in to me uh, and they told me that they were an alcoholic or a drug addict, uh, which they seldom did, but if they did do that, I, I painted them all with the same brush, whether they were active in recovery or active in their disease. I didn't make a distinction there. I just thought they were all bad. Um, and then, of course, there's reputation. We have to realize that the symptoms of the brain disease of addiction are antisocial in nature. So practicing addict is going to lie, cheat, steal, manipulate, uh, commit criminal acts to get the money to do the drugs or the alcohol. That is a symptom of the underlying disease just as cough, fever, and shortness of breath are symptoms of pneumonia. The other thing that I've seen in my practice and in the real world is an attitude of disgust. Um, and I think this is best encapsulated by Ebenezer Scrooge's response to some men who were soliciting uh, <laughs> contributions for uh, child welfare. And uh, he turned to them and said, if they would rather die, they had better do it and decrease the surplus population. And I've certainly seen that attitude. Um, you know, <coughs> let them die. It's one less to take care of. Ignorance. This is a big one. There are no good treatments. That's, that's, what, the, that's what they would have you believe. That's false. Um, methadone substitutes one addiction for another. That's also false. And we'll talk more about that as we get into the pharmacology of the drugs themselves. 
Denial. This is a big one. This is not a problem for me, for us, for our company, our town, etc. And you know what? Denial makes perfect sense. Because people who have this disease, you know, why would they want to admit to it? Because we live in the culture of John Wayne, where everybody is rough, tough, individualistic, and pulls themselves up by their bootstraps. And there are four diseases that you do not want to have in this culture. Anxiety, depression, or its cousin bipolar, alcoholism or drug addiction. Because if you got any of those, you got a weakness of character, an inability to deal with life, a case of chronic wimphood, or worse yet, a moral failing. Well, who in their right mind would want to cop to that? What's really happening in the setting of uh, addiction? Well, let's talk about the science for a minute. If I were going to synthesize a drug addict in a laboratory, I would need five things. Genetic predisposition, dysfunctional family of origin, early childhood physical or sexual trauma, concurrent psychiatric disorder, and access to booze and drugs. If you got all five of those, you are the perfect storm for addiction. I saw a 69-year-old gentleman in the methadone clinic this morning whose alcoholic mother left him alone between the ages of about 5 and 10 while she was gone for days on end. And he's an only child. I mean, that's horrendous neglect. Uh, and this is, if you, think, if you think this is a disease about stupid people, you need to stop right there, all right? 80% of Nobel laureates in literature are alcoholic, okay? So this it doesn't have anything to do with intellect. The man that I was talking to this morning, he was working on drones in the late 60s at White Sands, okay? For the Army or Air Force or whatever. Now they don't put dummies in those positions. Progression of disease involves obsession with the drug, compulsive use despite adverse life consequences. If these diseases are untreated, they result in insanity, incarceration, or death. But primarily, addiction is a brain disease. Look, drug addicts and alcoholics don't drink alcohol and shoot dope so that they can crash cars, go to jail, go broke, or lose relationships. They do it so that they can change how they feel. And of course, the target organ for changing how you feel is the brain. All right. Now the brain, for the purposes of this discussion, will be divided into three major areas. There is the reptilian complex down in the ponds in the medulla. This is a real primitive area of the brain. It tells your heart how often to beat. It tells you when to breathe. Right above that is the mesolimbic system, also known as the emotional brain. This is where the disease of alcoholism and drug addiction lives, within the emotional brain. Above the emotional brain is the cortical brain. And it's the cortical brain that we think of when we think of other people, because that's where your ability to do math, language, moralize, philosophize, judge, criticize, your so-called willpower, that's in your cortical brain. But the disease of addiction is not in the cortical brain. It's down in the mesolimbic system, in the emotional brain. Why do we have an emotional brain? We have an emotional brain because certain activities in life, like food, sex, exercise, drinking water when you're thirsty, when you do those activities, you release so-called pleasure chemicals within the emotional brain that tell you at an emotional, irrational, nonverbal level, keep doing this. It's essential to your survival. Notice how I said essential, not optional. Well. 
I doubt that there's any heroin addicts in here uh, today. So we're going to talk about alcohol for a minute because I know that practically everyone in this room has had a drink of alcohol. What is the difference between a normal temperate drinker and an alcoholic? The difference is that the phenomenon of craving is absent in the normal temperate drinker. But when an alcoholic takes a drink, they flip a switch in that mesolimbic system and one drink is too many and a thousand is not enough. I like to say that they have an on switch, but they have no off switch. All right? Why is it that willpower does not work in the setting of alcoholism or addiction. Willpower doesn't work because the brain is hierarchical in nature. The more primitive the area of the brain, the more power it has. So the reptilian complex outranks the emotional brain, it outranks the cortical brain, and the emotional brain outranks the cortical brain. Willpower is a manifestation. That's a cortical manifestation. All right? So you've got the dilemma of the alcoholic or addict is that they have a hijacked emotional brain. And if they take that substance in, they're going to flip a switch and the phenomenon of craving begins and the cycle starts all over. And if you get run over by a train, it wasn't the caboose that killed you. It was the engine of the first drink, all right? And that's what Alcoholics Anonymous is all about. It's about giving you a psychic defense against the first drink. The, uh, oops. We're going to move on now and talk about two uh, the septal nuclei. These are the pleasure centers within the brain. And um, let me back up for just a second, because one thing I do like to talk about is what does this look like in real life, this hierarchy? I'll tell you what, when my youngest son Kevin was eight years old, he went trick-or-treating. On November 1st, he had a huge sack of candy. He's eating the candy, eating the candy, eating the candy. Finally, I said, Kevin, you're going to get sick. And I took the candy away from him. What happened? He had an emotional reaction. He got angry. It percolated up to the cortex. Plan came out as follows. Daddy, if you don't give me that candy, I'm going to hold my breath until I die. So what do you think I told him? Go ahead, right. Because I knew that the reptilian complex would override his angry response. It would override his well-articulated plan and he would breathe again. This is the essence of addiction. This is it. It, it is not a weakness of character and inability to deal with life, a case of chronic wimphood or a moral failing. We are looking at a real live neurobiologic disease. The government knows this, okay? The federal government knows it, but for some reason not taking any action. Um, the septal nuclei in the ventral tegmental area and the nucleus accumbens, the, these are the pleasure centers. This is what drug addicts and alcoholics are looking to stimulate. They want to stimulate the release of dopamine from these areas to give them the sensation of pleasure. Notice something about um, these areas. This one, the ventral tegmental area, is mostly about downers. Ethanol, barbiturate, benzodiazepines, opioids. This one is mostly about uppers, amphetamines, cocaine. Oh, look, there's opioids again. There are only two drugs known to mankind that stimulate both of the septal nuclei. One is marijuana. No one has ever died from smoking marijuana alone. All right. Uh, the LD50 is too high. Um, and with marijuana, there's no real withdrawal syndrome. You just quit. But with opioids, plenty of people have died due to overdose, as we've already discussed. And it's got a really bad uh, withdrawal syndrome. What caused this problem? Well, actually, 
the medical profession. Pharmaceutical companies and the medical profession are largely responsible. And academic established medicine. In the late 80s and early 90s, the Institute of Medicine released a report on the lack of pain relief in patients dying of malignant disease. The pain movement began, um, eventually ending with pain being the fifth vital sign as adapted by JACO, but they have now gotten rid of that, thank God. Um, profits and unbridled enthusiasm led to narcotics for benign forms of pain. So we went from uh, not treating malignant cancer with appropriate amounts of narcotics all the way over to now we're giving opioids for fibromyalgia, you know. Um, these, this opioid crisis was based largely upon a small letter to the editor in 1980 by uh, Porter and Jick. It was based only on inpatients treated for acute pain, and it was six sentences in a one paragraph letter. There have been studies suggesting that addiction rarely evolves in the setting of painful conditions. There's no uh, methods described, uh, there is no uh, statistical uh, you know, rendering of uh, experimental and statistical information. There's just a letter. This letter was referenced over 600 times after the introduction of OxyContin in 1995. Well, fast forward to now. President Trump declares opioid crisis a national emergency on August 11th, 2017. The CDC had already declared prescription drug abuse to be a national epidemic. Massachusetts Governor Deval Patrick declared opioid addiction epidemic a public health emergency in March of 2014. And as early as 2011, a forward-looking Surgeon General in Florida began to crack down on pill mills. Pill mills are where addicts get uh, opiates and uh, benzos uh, from doctors who deal them. Um, and this graph right here gives uh, rise to the title of the talk, a flood of opioids and a rising tide of death. So as the number of kilograms of opioids are sold increases over time, death due to opioid overdose increases over time, and admissions for opioid abuse treatment increase. This is showing a fourfold increase in uh, overdose deaths between 99 and 2008. This is showing um, uh, dramatic increases in, uh, you know, deaths due to opioid, uh, prescription opioid overdose. Same thing, same song, second verse. Where do these people get these, non, uh, these prescription opioids? 55% get them from a free from a friend or a relative. 17% get them prescribed by a doctor. 11% um, uh, buy them from a friend. 5% uh, buy them from a dealer. 5% steal them and 7% other. Let's look, there was um, in Boston, uh, these two uh, pharmacists, Betsis and Brennan, who work for CVS, decided to look at the prescribing uh, habits of uh, physicians uh, in that area. And uh, they came up with 42 outlier prescribers. Now, non-outlier prescribers are people who are deemed to be prescribing opiates um, according to standard of care what would be uh, usual and customary. Uh, outliers are, are far from that. So, uh, and what we are, these numbers right here have to do with doses. Okay, so let's look at internal medicine. Um, in internal medicine, um, you have 12 outliers. The average non-outlier was prescribing 422 doses of Vicodin in a month. The outlier prescriber was prescribing 11,314 doses of Vicodin in the same month. 
How much does all of this cost us? Opioid cr crisis is costing us 78.5 annually and rising. These numbers I don't think are even relevant any longer. I think the figure is much higher than that. These are from 2004 and I couldn't find the latest figures. What's a natural history of uh, opioid dependence? One third of patients die in their 20s. One third die in their late 40s, early 50s after cycling through <coughs> jails, institutions, rehabs, um, shooting dope 40 to 60 percent of the time. And the other third eventually become abstinent. How dangerous are opiates? Well, I've already remarked on that a little bit, but let me remind you, let me put it in perspective. Frontline, uh, frontline mortality for a combat soldier in Vietnam, 3%. Smoke a pack a day for 20 years, 1%. Alcoholic, half a percent. Shoot dope, 7.2%. You would be better off joining the Army, serving on the front lines in Afghanistan, drinking a 12 pack a day, and smoking a pack of cigarettes a day, and you'd still be safer than if you decide to take up heroin. When we look at mortality rate, you know, I, I am the medical director of maintenance and recovery services, the largest for-profit methadone clinic here in town. It's run by Kim Comstock, who is a wonderful woman and a great boss. But at any rate, the thing is, is that when people come in and I put them on methadone, I feel like a hero, all right? Because people in the community refer to that as harm reduction. They look down on it, you know? But I refer to it as death reduction. Why is it death reduction? Because when they come in, I lower their mortality rate from 7.2% down to 1.4%. So what does that mean? All right, so let's say for the sake of argument that in this chair, I got a 21-year-old male college student who shoots heroin. And in this chair next to him, his identical twin who doesn't shoot heroin. The kid that shoots heroin is 63 times more likely to die this year. When he comes in to methadone treatment, he's only eight times more likely to die. What is the purpose of methadone and buprenorphine? Because I want you to remember that buprenorphine is just son of methadone. But what is the purpose of the drug? Eliminate drug craving, eliminate dope sickness. And if I have you on the right dose and you shoot dope, you will not get high. Why? Because your receptors are blocked. All right? What's a typical starting dose? Uh, in a methadone clinic, um, if somebody's shooting half a gram uh, or less of heroin, I will start them at 20 milligrams. If they are uh, shooting half a, a gram or more, uh, over, let's say uh, uh, over half a gram to up to two or three grams, I'll start them at 30 milligrams. But uh, we gradually use the median dose in, in methadone treatment, and it takes a while to get there, is usually between 80 and 120 milligrams. <coughs> What's the key? Retention and treatment. The longer they're in treatment, the better they do. When they leave treatment, they relapse. Methadone treatment decreases all-cause mortality and results in improvements in morbidity due to infectious disease and criminality. Patients in treatment can return to productive lives free of criminality. In the May 29, 2014 issue of the New England Journal, Dr. Nora Volkov, director of NIDA, National Institutes of Drug Abuse, strongly advocated medication-assisted therapies, that's methadone and buprenorphine, for tackling the o overdose epidemic. But the practical issues that arise from this recommendation have to do with stigma regarding the use of this treatment. Look, you all probably don't know this, all right? But when you look at the sober community or the, the community of people in this town that is recovering, 
it's basically polarized into those who are abstinent slash sober and those who are taking methadone or buprenorphine. Now, those who are abstinent or sober are usually involved in the 12-step program. They usually have had a spiritual awakening which has relieved them of the obsession and compulsion to use uh, drugs or alcohol. Um, but they um, preferentially own most of the treatment centers and uh, they are big within the sober community.